So today we're going to talk about Closure Web Development Evolved, and we'll present a kit framework that myself and Nick have been working on. So a little bit about us. Um, my name is Dmitry Sotnikov. Uh, I'm the author of Luminous Framework, Selmer, and Web Development of Closure. Sorry, I needed to unmute. I'm Nick. Uh, I come from uh, previously of uh, the world of management. I used to be the vice president of technology at a market research startup where we used Closure. Uh, currently, I work as a lead backender at a, a, a small tech consultancy in Switzerland. Uh, and I've been working with Closure now for, I think, almost 10 years. All right, so I guess to give a little bit of a background on how we ended up making Kit and why we made it. Um, so obviously I've maintained Luminous for a number of years and the motivation behind Luminous was really to make closure a bit more accessible and also to provide a few common patterns for web development in closure. And over the years, the closure ecosystem obviously has evolved and some patterns have changed, like tooling has improved and Luminous basically kind of like is starting to show its age. So we, we did use it kind of like as a starting point and then we took some lessons learned from it. And one of the biggest problems with Luminous is that it is monolithic and opinionated. And what I mean by that, it's ultimately just a lane engine template and any functionality in Luminous has to be baked into the template. So it means if the maintainers of the framework aren't using those features, aren't interested in them, you're probably not going to get them in. Or even if you do, they're not going to get good support. Uh, so this is one of the problems that I wanted to address. And the other thing is that Luminous used older tooling, it's based on lane engine, and we now clearly see that the community is moving towards using the official tooling. And at this point, I think Closure CLI has caught up in future parity with lane engine, and there's decreasing justification to not just use the standard tooling that comes with the language. And finally, Closure ecosystem has evolved. Um, I think the modern practice is to use data-driven approach and Integrant, I think, facilitates that much better than Mount. And I think it kind of like encourages better architecture and design. And we'll see a bit of that as we go through the presentation. So what is the philosophy behind Kit? Um, as I mentioned, one of the shared goals with Luminous is to make closure web development accessible. Um, and to do that, you want to facilitate uh, common use cases, kind of following the 80-20 rule, where you get something out of the box that works reasonably well, that has same defaults, and you can just focus on adding your own functionality that's relevant to your application and not have to worry about too much about how to set up your project, what libraries to use, and so on. We also would like to simplify the official tooling a bit. Um, so closure tooling, basically, is on parity with lane engine, but unfortunately, it's a bit harder to use. It's a little less, uh, a bit less obvious. With lane engine, right? Like you have like the common tasks really encapsulated, where you have you know lane test, lane run, lane REPL, lane Uber jar, and it's very obvious how to do that. Uh, with closure tooling, you know you might have to do it through Depsidon, or you may do it through tools build, and there is like more options, more flags to know. So we basically provide a Babushka script that kind of wraps it up and makes it as easy to use as Lane Gen. And we also provide some default structure, right? So Kit will provide sort of a kernel that creates you know, the core of your application, your HTTP handler, your router, and then everything else is kind of built on top of that. And the final piece is documentation because Really, if you're a beginner, you need some way to figure out how to do common tasks, right? Like, how do you manage your sessions? How do you manage cookies? You know, how do you do routing? All those things. And like, it's not ideal to have to hunt around blogs or Stack Overflow or maybe like, you know, go to Closure Ruins to get help. So we kind of want to provide all this common documentation in one place and have it curated and to ensure that it's high quality. And 
the stack we want to provide is should serve both beginners and experienced developers alike, right? So we want to provide something that's a lean core that's easy to extend. And that's the core would be an opinionated enough that it isn't going to hamstring experienced developers who want to take it in their own direction while still providing enough harness for beginners so they don't get lost. And that's kind of like the balance we're really trying to find. And the idea is to provide as many good defaults as possible, but also ability to override these defaults if they don't work for you and you know you want to take a project in a different direction. And finally, it's all built on battle tested stacks that we're both using in production. And it's all built you know, on libraries that we have used in anger and you know work for us and hopefully work for most people. And also, you know, have been embraced by the community. So what is Kit? And before I answer that question, like I'd, I'd like to kind of create a spectrum, right? Like I, I think that on one end of the spectrum, we have frameworks, and this would include stuff like Rails, Spring, where the framework is makes a lot of decisions for you, right? Like you can think of it as sort of a tree trunk that's been implemented and you just kind of like go to the edges and the branches and you implement the functionality as the leaves of that trunk, right? Like that would be like your business logic. And the advantages of frameworks is that they're beginner friendly. There is usually, you know, very good documentation. Um, all the decisions are made for you. They're very consistent. And, you know, like as long as you're doing stuff within the scope of what the authors of the framework envisions are very convenient. The downside of frameworks is that they tend to be fairly monolithic. You tend to inherit a lot of baggage, whether you use it or not. And there is a lot of complexity involved. Uh, when you make a trivial project, this complexity might not be apparent. And you know, sometimes you can just write a couple lines of configuration and get like a lot of functionality out of that. But really understanding what happens can take a lot of time. And this is kind of a problem, right? Because you end up with those large projects that really do simple things. And sometimes you end up in a scenario where you inherit just a lot of bloat that you don't really need. And I think this is where we get to the other side of the spectrum that closure community embraced traditionally, where you just use libraries, right? And especially like in closure world, libraries tend to be very small and focused and they're flexible and they're easy to put together. So you sort of end up with this Lego-based development, I would call it, right? Like <laughs> each library is kind of like a Lego brick and you can take those Lego bricks and put them together in the exact way you want and get complex functionality out of that. And you're not restricted in any way and you don't have to inherit any baggage when you make your project. So you end up with those very lean projects that do exactly what you want. Uh, downside is that you really have to know the ecosystem and understand what you're doing to do this effectively. And if you're a beginner, it's it's a very daunting task to find all the libraries that work well, that are well maintained, and to put them together in a way that works well. And even if you do that, you end up with a lot of inconsistency because each experienced developer might have different ideas on how they structure projects. And so each project becomes kind of like a unique snowflake. And this makes it difficult to move around between projects. So even like within the same company, you know, you could have two developers start different projects and structure them in different ways using different libraries. And then, you know, there is a non-trivial cost to have people move between those projects. And that means the quality is going to vary as well because the depending on the skill of the developer who originally structured the project, you could get different results. So ideally we'd like to kind of take the best of both worlds here, right? To get some consistency, to get good foundation for the project, but also not to inherit a lot of baggage and to kind of restrict the developers from doing what they need to do. And this is where we see Kit, with being both beginner friendly well-documented, consistent, but also flexible and adaptable to different projects. And during the presentation, hopefully we'll convince you that Kit accomplishes those goals. So now I'll pass it on to Nick to talk a little bit about the architecture of the project. Okay, um, so at its core, Kit is made up of, uh, or at least the kernel of Kit, the part that really is not that easily changeable, is made up of four different libraries. 
And it's okay if uh, you don't know what all of these are, we'll go through them in a bit. Uh, so we have arrow, integrand, ring, and rated. And the idea behind having this uh, core is that these allow us to build uh, extensible components that we can use as edges in our application. And what I mean by this is that we want to keep our IO, uh, what we read and write from different sources at the edges of our application so that we can have all of the business logic decoupled from that. Uh, this allows you to better test your business logic uh, in total isolation from any external dependencies, any services that you might require. And it also allows you to have your edges be modular and self-contained. And the major benefit of this, uh, which you'll also see through the kit um, design in terms of libraries, is that you can have these be parts of multiple projects. These are things that you can move across projects and configure in different ways. Um, so now to break down a little bit some of those libraries I talked about, I think it would be useful to look at a typical HTTP request flow for uh, a, a web application. So normally you would get some sort of a request from uh, you know, an API uh, service or maybe a, a front end would send a request to your server uh, and your HTTP server uh, it would receive it. In the case of Kit, the default is undertow, but you can always uh, switch it out for Jetty or something else. This isn't a hard requirement. Uh, so let's say undertow receives that and it passes it on to Ring. Ring is this great library that probably a lot of you who have worked with web development and Clojure are familiar with. Uh, it takes uh, data from these uh, servers and it's really agnostic. Also, you can use it with Jetty and it transforms it to data and passes it along to your router. Uh, in the case of Kit, this is rate it, uh, and then rate it decides where it where this request is going to go. Essentially, it says uh, this function is going to evaluate this request. Maybe it will talk to a database. Maybe it'll talk to a cache. Maybe it'll call an external service. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do here. But at the end of the day, it's going to get back something that it's going to pass along as a response. Now, as for the other two. Um, those come into play when we look at the system uh, behind Kit. So ultimately, uh, we're using a data-driven architecture here. Your system is defined as a need and file. And all of these individual edges or components are, uh, are defined in that, uh, data, uh, in that data, that system, need and file. So with that, we are using Arrow and Integrate. And we find that these two libraries play very well together. Uh, Arrow lets you define a template for the system with a bunch of reader macros to simplify your life. And Integrant then takes that configuration and instantiates those runtime components when you start your application. So I've given a, a small example here on the right. Uh, here we're trying to start up a cache and in development, let's say we want to spin up um, a Docker container with a cache and run that instead of running our, a, a server somewhere and having to reference that. So uh, first we define this component uh, dev Redis and presumably behind this, we have some business logic that takes this configuration that says uh, spin up a Docker container. Maybe it's a test container with uh, the six Alpine version of Redis and it'll do that. And the great thing about Integrant is now we can reference this component inside our, our actual cache component. Um, and here we have this cache Redis component, it's all defined. And you'll see these IG slash ref uh, reader macros that, um, uh, yeah, uh, 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 reader symbols that uh, point to the cache dev Redis. And this tells Integrant that now this component uh, depends on cache dev Redis, so it'll spin up cache dev Redis, and that's how it'll start it up. Uh, but also we have profile and env, and these are tools, uh, or, or, or these are parts of Arrow. And Arrow lets you um, have a lot of these. There's a bunch more that uh, aren't shown here, but it gives you a bunch of these um, uh, the tools that you can use when you're defining your system. Um, so for example, here, it's great to say we have a dev test and prod environment. And for dev and test, we want to use our container. But for prod, we want to use the URI. Uh, so we think that these two uh, libraries go very well uh, when it comes to defining your system. So what, um, what are really the elements of kits 
when we look at it as a whole project. So we have the template. So this is um, the wiring that you have when you're starting a project. Um, this is what's going to generate your code. We have libraries that provide a bunch of core functionality as well as any optional features that you may want to have. So these are typically your edges of the application communicating with the database, so on. You have modules. Uh, we think this is a pretty cool and innovative thing from Kit, which allows you to add wiring after you started a project and say you forgot to add a database. So you say, okay, let me hook up a database. Uh, and lastly, there's documentation that we're constantly improving just to keep everyone sane. So uh, just to run through quickly, to create a new Kit project, you would use um, uh, Sean Corfield's uh, CLJ new uh, utility, which uh, you can install using the Closure CLI tools. Um, you can see an example there on the right. And this provides different features that you can instantiate at project creation. There's profiles as uh, just like there are profiles with Luminous. So you can say, for example, add a database and so on when you start your, uh, start your project. Uh, just to give a quick breakdown on the right, you can see this is a simple project that we've created. And uh, it has an end folder that has your three different environments by default. You can add other ones. It has some resources that you can use um, as files uh, when you're uh, running your application. This will be useful, for example, to hold your system Eden or maybe to hold queries or HTML resources and so on. And you have your sources and test folders. And of course, breaking down the source folder, you can see we've broken it down by default to controllers, middleware, and routes. But you can, of course, change that up however you like. So libraries. Uh, we think that this is probably uh, a big component of Kit. So we've curated a lot of libraries um, that, that make your life uh, simpler. Um, we like to think of it if, if a kit application is like a book, then Integrant gives you that glue, and then the libraries provide those pages that give you the content. So um, out of the box, you can just use these as dependencies, require them in, and configure them, and that's it. However, you can also extend them by overriding the Integrant multi-methods. And we think this is a really cool feature because um, maybe you're working on a super complicated project, and the default just doesn't work for you then you can still use the library, but say, get rid of uh, or extend uh, a multi-method that wasn't working the way you needed it. So in general, the libraries are pretty simple and uh, there's not much to them. They simply start some sort of service. Uh, so we have an example here on the right for a socket REPL. Uh, there's this uh, integrant lifecycle. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but in this case, we have a prep key. Uh, so here is where you're taking your configuration and you're, you might add to it, you might change it a bit. In this case, we add a default uh, na name. So we give it a main name. Um, and then you go down to the init key. This is uh, when Integrant starts up components. This is the function that, it, or this is the multi-method that gets evaluated. So uh, here uh, we start up the server and it returns this config. So the return value for init key is kind of important because you can use this later. Uh, and then when you, when you stop uh, the component, that's when halt key is called. Uh, halt key takes that component from, or it takes that config from your running system and you can do whatever you like with it. In this case, we simply fetch the name and stop the nREPL server. So if you wanted to use that um, uh, library, the simplest thing you could do is require it in in your depths Eden um, and then use it in your system Eden, define it in your system so that when it starts up, uh, it knows to use it. Um, and that's all. And now I'll pass it back over to Dimitri to talk about modules. All right. So as I mentioned before, one of the problems with Luminous was that everything kind of had to be baked into the template. And of course, the other problem was that if you created a new project, uh, you couldn't use Luminous to add functionality to it later. So for example, I've found myself in this situation multiple times as dog food and Luminous where, you know, I make a project and I'm like, oh, I want to use a database or I want to add closure script support. And now, you know, either I make a whole new project or I have to manually do all the plumbing. And that's really not ideal. So what we ended up doing for Kit is to leverage uh, this fantastic rewrite CLJ library 
that allows you to modify closure and hidden files and to create templates that can be run within your existing project and they'll modify the code in your project to do the necessary wi uh, wiring in addition to you know generating assets and adding dependencies so this does rely on you kind of like keeping the original project structure stuff like the you know like keeping the generated files that were originally in the template for this to work if it can't find the file it'll just you know print out in a in a REPL what it failed what it tried to do and what it failed so you can manually do it yourself later but in the general case the way it would work is you would create a git repository with those templates and then Kit has its own kit.eden file that it generates. And kit eden, you just reference, you know, the repository you want to use. Similar way you add project dependencies in. And then the templates will have um, eden files, uh, like the one we're seeing here on the right. And it's basically a map and has profiles. So you can have, say, like a default, but then say you have like a database uh, template and you might want to do, you know, like Postgres, MySQL, and so on. So you might have different parameters. So you could provide different profiles for it with hints. Uh, in this case, we just have a default profile. And this one hints that you know, you'll have to restart your REPL after running this. Uh, this usually only happens if you need to add like some dependencies or do big modifications to your project. Then we have assets. In this case, we don't have any assets, but basically it would be exact same thing we have with Lynch and templates. Like if you need to generate an HTML file or shadow seal JS config, We'll see some of that later in the live demo. And finally, we have the interesting part, which is the injections. So first injection says, you know, we're updating an Eden file, uh, passes depths Eden, that's relative to our project root. And what we want to update is uh, depths, which is our target. And we'll merge into depths, our new dependency for kit and REPL. And once we've done that, we also want to update our system Eden and add the configuration for the end REPL. And finally, we'll update our core namespace to uh, reference uh, and REPL namespace so it actually gets loaded. And once those three things happen, uh, you'll have and REPL support in your project. So it's very easy to use those templates, but it's also very easy to write your own templates. So if you have some functionality you want to add on top of Kit that's you know only you, you yourself use, you can just make a Git repo and put it there, right? Like you can do it for your company or you can publish it publicly and have people consume that. And, and finally for documentation, as I mentioned, we have a curated site similar to Luminous. Um, documentation is just stored in markdown files and it's again, easy to contribute. And we're hoping that it's going to provide a way for people to kind of like find how to do things with Kit in one place instead of having to scour the internet. And we already had a number of contributors who we'd love to thank. Uh, if you don't see yourself there, sorry, it may be a bit of out of date, but we still appreciate your support. And we really hope to get like a bit more community engagement with the project to set the directions for it and help extend it to make it more usable. And finally, uh, Kit really encourages interactive development. I think this is one of those things people coming to Clojure often don't have experience with and don't realize the power of because mainstream languages simply don't provide this option. Like we do have REPLs in languages like Python and like even Java now, but having a REPL in a language like Python is really just having this interactive shell on the side. It's not part of your development workflow. And this is the big difference with Clojure. With Clojure, you really develop your application from the REPL. You start your app and you connect your editor to your running application instance, and then you develop your application as it runs. And this is a very transformative workflow in my opinion. And I like if you're not using this workflow and you're working with Clojure, you're really, really missing out. And I encourage you to start using this. And to that, and Kit kind of tries to encourage this by doing the modules, making them available from the REPL. So you can literally start your application and add extended functionality to the application directly from the REPL. And we'll see that in a few minutes. So without further ado, let's move on to the actual demo and see how all of this works in practice. Okay, so uh, so for the demo, uh, 
I will be moving a little bit quickly, uh, but we'll make the source code for the demo available afterwards. You can uh, pull it down and uh, I'm sure the, the video for this will be up at some point. Uh, the goal is to showcase what you can do with Kit, uh, as well as how to build a simple guestbook application. So this might be a bit of an extension of the tutorial that we have on the documentation, but we also have a little bit of closure script that is uh, new. So, okay. First thing we're going to do is start a new project. So I'm going to uh, create a new Git project using the uh, Git CLJ template. Uh, we'll call it the London Closurians Guestbook. And that'll take a minute, pull in the latest steps, and create a project. Great. So, yeah, now if I uh, CD into the Guestbook, yeah, it has a bunch of files. That's good. Um, so let me just open that up in IntelliJ. Oh, one second. Uh, I'm just doing this on another screen, but I'll bring it over in a sec. Guestbook in here. Uh, okay. So I take it everyone can still see this. Um, so uh, like we mentioned earlier in the presentation, you get this structure here. Not going to focus too much about that. Let's get into the interesting stuff and set up a REPL so that we can see if something actually works. Um, with IntelliJ uh, and Depths, uh, one thing to note is that you have to open up this like little tab on the side. I'm not sure how much of this will be visible in the recording. And make sure the dev profile is selected and then reload the Depths so that it pulls in uh, things like the kit um, uh, generator library and other ones that are needed for REPL driven development. Uh, so I think that's going to be done. Uh, let me add a REPL config. Great. And now we can spin something up. Let's move this over to the bottom. Move to bottom left. OK. So we got a REPL. Um, so uh, out of the box, this starts you up in the username space. Here we've required in a bunch of handy utilities for you. Um, so things like the integrant REPL library, that gives you nice functions like Go, which will uh, prep your system configuration and start it up, initialize it. So let's do that and just see if things work. So great, something's happened, says our server is started on port 3000. Let's quickly see if that's a lie. Uh, let's close 3000. Oh, uh, under the API route. And there's something here. Yeah, that's good. And also, presumably, if we call the one route, uh, it returns to 200. That's great. Um, but that's kind of dull for an application. We need to get something more interesting here. So what we're going to do for that, let's see, over here in project. Um, we have this uh, kit Eden file that defines how it is that the um, application pulls in modules and uh, uh, basically how it's going to generate code for you. So uh, the name, how it's going to sanitize the name, things like that. Uh, for now, we're just pulling modules in from the publicly available kit modules uh, repo. Uh, you can access this on GitHub. Uh, however, if you wanted to, you can create a private repo and have your private modules there and use them that way. Um, so let's get using these. Um, so again, in the user namespace, um, we have this uh, uh, kit API alias. So here we can first sync the modules. So what this will do is it will pull in the Git repositories. It's done. Let's see uh, what modules do we have available to us. OK, so we have a couple. Uh, I think the first thing that we're going to want to add is SQL capability. So we'll give it a database. So we'll do that by, say, kit install module. I'll paste in kit SQLite. And then that's going to do a bunch of things. Stuff moved fast. Uh, let's break it down. So what it did was. Um, it rewrote a bunch of files, adding additional information to them. So it rewrote our system Eden, our depths Eden, our core CLJ function, appending some requires. 
And then um, the cool thing is we also added the, uh, the ability using a, a third party library to hot reload uh, your libraries in a running REPL instance. And for the most part, this is pretty stable. Uh, so even though we pulled in a new dependency, we don't need to restart our REPL. You can keep working in this. Um, let's start breaking down now uh, uh, what's happened. So we, in our system Eden, we added a bunch of new components at the bottom. We added the SQL connection, query function, and migrations. That's great. So now in theory, we have this uh, SQL component and we can write some SQL migrations, but we actually need to do that. So um, let's, uh, let me refresh this or reload from disk. And let's actually add some migrations. Uh, so out of the box, we're using Migratus uh, for handling our migrations. Of course, if you want, you can use something else. Uh, so in the REPL, let's uh, require in Migrate to migrate core as migrations. Great. And then we can say migrations create. Um, my, I think migrate is great. Take some migration there. So we'll give it our migrations directory and we'll call it just init migration. And that will now create a file. I need to reload from disk, of course. So it creates for us two files, an up and down migration. Uh, I think for this kind of project, we're just going to keep it simple. We're going to, uh, let's say, create table guestbook, and that's going to have an ID, integer, primary key, auto increment, um, a name that's a var char 30, and let's say message 200, and just give it a timestamp. Uh, Timestamp default current timestamp. Great, very very simple. Nothing too fancy. For down migration, we'll just drop the table if it exists. Uh, so great. Now we will have a schema of sorts, uh, but we have no actual way of uh, accessing it. So let's write a couple of queries that are useful to us. Um, I think we need only two. We need to save a message and we'll return. So uh, this is using hug SQL uh, behind the scenes, uh, which takes a bunch of SQL and transforms it later into data that you can use uh, in within closure and call these SQLs and pass in some parameters. So I'm, I'm not gonna get into too much uh, on how all of that works, but uh, the gist is that you can do things like name message and give it values like uh, that are keywords. And then when you pass in a map with those keywords, it'll plop in those values. And then we also want to get messages, which is a query returning multiple things. XR, guess both. Great. Uh, I don't know if uh, I probably don't need the semicolon, but force a half. Um, so we have some queries, we have some migrations. In theory now, if we hit reset, things should not explode, but because it's a live demo, we'll see. Okay, seems to have worked. We've reloaded, we've seen, we created some migrations. It saw that we had a new migration and ran it. So in theory now, I should be able to write and read from my database. Let's see how we can do that. In our system Eden file, there's this query function. So this is where hug SQL comes into play. What it's going to do is it's going to take a database connection. It's going to take this queries file and give us the ability to call those queries. Um, I mean, by default, I'll, I'll show you how you can use this in an application properly later. But when I'm just tinkering in the REPL, I might do something like um, def query function and uh, get it from my running system. And so. Uh, You'll notice out of the box, this is coming from integrant REPL state. This is, again, the integrant REPL utility. It's super handy when you're working in the REPL with integrant. So uh, I'm going to call the first, I'm going to call the save message. And say uh, my name and hello, London. And hopefully, yeah, this gives us a result. That's good. We have some progress. So now, if we call um, 
get messages, get messages. Hopefully it will give us back a message, which is good. We have progress, but we're still only in the REPL. It's not that interesting. We need to add it somehow to the API. We need to add it to the UI. So let's do that. Um, like I mentioned before, the structure of the folders on the side, we got some controllers. So let's add some guestbook controllers, uh, guestbook. And there, so for this, I'm just going to paste some stuff in and explain what it is because it's, uh, uh, I think we just made it look very nice. There isn't a lot going on. Uh, in reality, we have two functions. Uh, we have the save message function, and this is going to take a request with a name and a message. And it's basically just going to call that query function that we were playing around with in the REPL. So here it's going to take a name and a message and ideally save it to the database. And if it's not, if it doesn't get an exception, which means it's saved properly, it's going to return an OK response to whatever made the request. Great. And then list messages, even simpler, just going to query that database for all the messages, just like we did in the REPL. Nothing fancy going on. But to hook this all up uh, and add it to our API, we need access. We need to give our API access to the database, specifically to the uh, query function uh, that we were using in the REPL. And the way we do that is now through the system definition. So we can take the db sql query function and we can reference it using integrant so let's say query function integrant reference and we'll use the tag literal ig ref and then give it the component so now next time we start up the application it's going to know that in order to start our api it's going to need to start the query function all of this is built up inside integrate and you don't need to keep it in on top of your mind or like somehow uh order your components properly so it's it's similar to uh things like mount if you're familiar with that so that's great we've hooked that part up let's actually add the routes now so we can do that london clj we can add our guestbook as guestbook and we need create so that's a post request it takes uh parameters uh it's going to have a name which is a string and a message which is also a string and uh then we have to handle that guest book save message also do list and then this is just going to be a get request and for that we can say guest book list messages so Simple enough. Um, let's see if that actually works. So let me, oh, actually I didn't need to do that. I could just run reset. So in theory, again, what reset does is if we if we look at it in the source code for the integrant REPL is it suspends the running system. So it pauses it, uh, uh, refreshes the code and after it's refreshed, it runs the resume function. So it starts it back up and a bunch of the uh, kit uh, components that we have have defaults built in for these. So we hit that, we started stuff great. Now, in theory, we refresh, we got ourselves create and list. So something is here. Let's see if they actually work. Uh, so, uh, uh, hello again. Okay. So we got a 200 back progress. Uh, let's see if the list function also, or the list endpoint works. So we execute it and yeah, okay, we've got back our data. Good, great. We have an API. That's really cool. But I think we can also visualize this. And we're going to try and add some uh, CLJS today. Uh, so this we're going to also do by using modules. Uh, so if, you know what, I'll list them again. So we don't have a lot of modules yet, but that's the goal to add more. Uh, we have this kitsealjs module that we can hit install module. And it's going to do a bunch of stuff now. It'll um, uh, pull in shadow CLJS. It'll also create some HTML files for us. So there's a lot of stuff going on. And this is the one time in the demo that I will have to stop the REPL and reboot it because there's some issue with the class path and it's kind of annoying. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we'll do the 
npm install and all of the fun stuff that's involved with the front end. So shadow CLJS watch app. Great. So one fun part is uh, like we do transient dependencies too because um, Closure Script depends on HTML stuff, right? So you don't have to manually know to install HTML module before installing Closure Script module. And if you already have HTML installed, it keeps track of the modules that are available. Okay, so now I think we can start this up. Hopefully it won't explode uh, on us. In theory, if we go to our browser and now hit localhost 3000, we get a page. So uh, let me quickly run through. Uh, there was a ton of stuff generated, uh, but I'll quickly show off. It added this pages routes. So what this is, is it's going to pull in that transient dependency Dimitri mentioned, uh, which is for the HTML. Uh, and it pulls that in, pulls in Selmer. And this renders now our home page when we get to the root, which is awesome. Um, now we have that. And uh, we also pulled in, uh, of course, the closure script stuff. It also generated code in our uh, build script so that when we package our Uber jar, it's going to package the closure script as well. We'll see that in a second. Uh, but in general, we now have closure script and we have hot reloading. And if I do that, it'll give me two exclamation marks, which is exciting. Um, but how about we paste in some uh, code for that? Uh, there's too much front end code to actually go through it all. So you're just going to have to take my word for it that it's a basic front end code for a guestbook. And now it's going to reload. There we go. Looks kind of ugly, but we have something. I think we can do a little bit better. And using that uh, HTML that was generated, let's add some styling. Let's get rid of this hello world. Let's give it uh, maybe above our screen CSS to do, to do better practice. And let's also add in our CSRF. So uh, just copying this over. Uh, so we're going to add in some Bulma styling, and there's a CSRF uh, to prevent cross-site request forgery, uh, and all of this uh, I'm not going to get too much into. But now, if I reload the page, it'll look nicer. And let's see if it actually works. Uh, there we go. So we have a running guestbook. Super exciting. Now let's say we want to package this and throw it up somewhere on the internet. We can do, um, yeah, let's say, oops, JDBC URL. Uh, so what I'm doing here is because for development, we're using this local environment, but for production, we're going to have an environment variable JDBC URL that's passed in. So for now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to paste in the dev one so we have that accessible. So our JDBC URL is equal to that. And then we're going to, uh, oh, actually, sorry, I didn't even build it. Uh, so first, we need to build it. Uh, build all. So let's explain what's happening here. Uh, so uh, this is calling the Closure Tools uh, build script. So uh, this lets you define a build CLJ file. And in it, you can basically, basically tell uh, the, the Closure CLI tool how to build your application. Uh, in the case here, we're doing everything. So we're cleaning out old stuff. We're preparing the build. So writing any POM files, copying directories for resources, and so on. And then running the Uber jar. So compiling the CLJ, CLJS, and uh, creating an actual Uber jar file in our target folder. And so, uh, oh, uh, yeah. go back for a sec. Also, if you don't want to remember the like, commands, if you look at the BB hidden file above, we also define some convenient tasks. So if you have a bash installed, you can just say bb uber jar and we'll do, do that for you. Yeah. And similarly, if you're a fan of make file or just files or something, you can put these in one of those yourself. So it should make it easier. Uh, and now I think if I store JDBC URL, uh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Java jar target yes, Mark? Oh, I uh, forgot the ampersand. <laughs> ampersand? Uh... Or just do it like a separate commands. Oh, I don't actually, I don't need to export. I can just do this. 
Okay, yeah, yeah. Ah, we still have our, I, I did this mistake the other day. We still have our old server running. Can't have that. Uh, uh, can't halt. Right, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, could have halted too. And it'll start up um, our running server now in theory. 3000. Still has our data, which is awesome. Uh, more data. I, I mean, let's ignore that the time zone is UTC. Things don't need to be perfect. Uh, Great. Now we have even more data, um, and that's it's it's pretty cool how like quickly you can piece together all of these things when you're just hacking away. And the idea is that we want Kit to be something that is super easy for people to get started with, but then also gives you all of that flexibility, uh, especially as uh, senior developers and people working with complex projects to piece together things uh, the way that you want and need it to work. So, with that done. Let's go back to the presentation. Now it properly full screens. OK. Um, so we have a lot of future work planned for Kit. Uh, we, we want to add modules for each of the libraries that we have. Right now, as you probably saw, we don't have a lot of modules available. So we just have things like the CLJS and SQLite ones. Uh, we also want to finalize this API that we've been talking about for a while now called the Snippets API. And the idea behind it is that we want in the REPL you to be able to get some snippets uh, for commonly used things that you do, maybe creating routes or creating uh, reframe uh, elements in the front end uh, and actually create some snippets. Uh, and we want to also to centralize the dependency update process. So right now we have dependencies in each of these libraries and ideally we want them all in one place so we can see them in one place and update them everywhere. Uh, and of course, always we want to add more documentation. It's a very big thing. Um, at the end of the day, Kit's a community-driven project, and we are always open to feedback and suggestions. We really want to work with the Clojure community uh, to make this a really solid web framework that's accessible to newcomers and reliable and trusted by experienced de developers. Um, if you want to check out the project, uh, here's the GitHub repo and the documentation. Uh, you can also just Google Kit Closure, and hopefully it'll be one of those uh, top few links. Um, that's that. Uh, I guess now we can open it up to questions and answers. Is that right? Uh, 